Hello everybody. Welcome back to the channel. We're here with Mr. Dave Tate himself. Is that a handshake or is yeah. it like a... Uh, it's both. Yeah, yeah. It's both. We're at a Elite ghost shake. FCS right now <laughs> in Ohio and uh, Film and Table Talk podcast. And we thought we'd get somebody who's been around the sport of powerlifting for about a billion years to give us his opinions on a few powerlifting related topics. We're going to do a little over under with Dave Tate. So Dylan's going to give us the categories. Now, Dave, you have to give it an over or an under. Yeah. There is there is no in between unless maybe we concede on a topic. That might right. be an option. So. so if I'm indifferent, I have to act like I care. <laughs> <laughs> or at least, uh, you know, pretend to shit on one of them or something. Got it. Yeah. Got it. All right. So Dylan, what do we got for our, our first topic? Take it away, man. All right, so this is actually a, a bonus topic. The bonus item is uh, Baconators. 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 They are um, they are overrated here. So what do you I'll do? go with overrated as well. I mean, I don't I don't really uh, mess with them that much. But what's what's your justification for that? <laughs> I feel like there's a story here. We were there's told a, specifically there's a story. To there's a story. There's a John Meadows story from that. Okay. To where. Um, when I was training with him, he had, it's the Baconator story, he, he killed the bathroom. Killed the bathroom. <laughs> Not just like what you would think killed the bathroom, like killed the bathroom like there was shit on the walls, on the floor, on the stalls. So it literally, he was late, you know, <laughs> getting to the training session because he had to clean all of it, right? So then oh, I'm thinking man. to myself, I need to try a bacon acre. Cause that's what he had eaten beforehand? <laughs> yeah, but I'm like, I need it. to try that. Cause he was telling me how good they were. Right. Right. And I, well, if it's so good that that happens, but you <laughs> it's still gotta say, be worth it, right? You know, yeah. you still say it's good. I gotta try it. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I, it, it, I didn't have the same experience, but that's it, good. It, it cleaned me out. There it you go. cleaned me out. So yeah. There you go. Anybody needs to take a good shit, go get a yeah, bacon Yeah, a bacon <laughs> So I've not had one since then. All mm -hmm. right, I feel like that sets the tone for yeah, things. Yeah, that works. That works. <laughs> what do you got next, Dill? Our first topic Kay. or like category is equipment. Okay. Uh, and the first item is safety squat bar. Safety squat bar. Underrated. Underrated. You're a fan of the safety squat bar as well, hey? Yes. I think it's just one of the best things ever. <clears throat> I became more of a fan of it. I hated it when I was at West Side training with it because it was different the way, there's still bars made that way now where the pad's shorter, it's okay. not long. Right. So the shorter pad sits more over your spine. Right, right? like so up this, high on your neck almost. Yeah, yeah so yeah. it's a high bar with a lot of spinal compression. And when we would use it for low box max effort work, it was kind of like a deadlift, right? Because you're rounding up. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And it just beat the living shit out of you. I can see that. Um, when I had no other, I couldn't use a straight bar anymore, that was my go-to. Yeah. Was I just want to use this to squat, but I couldn't use it for more than a few weeks. Right. Because my back would just get trashed from it. So it's that's when I came up with a wider pad to displace the force over the whole thing. That makes sense. Right? So I can say that like a short pad with that high bar compression on that, that one's probably underrated from the standpoint of people who want to build a weak point, you know, say if it's conjugate and it's max effort. Right, right. And they want to do it to build their deadlift, that's probably going to be more conducive because yeah. it's going to round you over Let, a, yeah, a yeah. lot, yeah. right? Which now you got to fight that to build the upper back. The wider pad's gonna allow that displacement a little bit better. A little more low so, bar ass. Yeah, then you can keep yeah. that low bar position, which is more hips and glutes. So the answer is still the same, but for different reasons. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, it's, it's all I can use is like a safety squat bar, a spider bar, Mars bar, padded bar. Yeah. Um, flip Just because of the shoulder front. position? Yeah, I yeah. can't get my arms back. Yeah, so fair enough. I have a biased opinion for a couple reasons. It's the, one of the only things I can do and I created the wider pad version. I mean, so. my first experience with a safety squat bar was the Rogue one, and I was like, eh, like, I don't know. I'm not really, mm -hmm. not really feeling it. But with, then we got one of the Elite FTS ones with that pad that is like mm -hmm. legendary. And uh, I remember squatting on the Elite FTS one and completely changing my opinion about it. And to this day now, it's one of my favorite accessories. I think I can actually safety squat like almost one to one with my my like low bar back yes. squat on that. Yes, I would put one disadvantage out that I do see with intermediates and below is they they will use it too frequently 
instead of their straight bar. Mm -hmm. So before you can do that, say if it's a conjugate matter or say you were just gonna use that instead of a straight bar for off season blocks, sure. your technique needs to be really solid. Right. Right, because it, it, it is, from a specificity standpoint, it's still there, but mm -hmm. if you're a low bar squatter, it's kind of a high bar. Yeah. And then when they go back to the straight bar, they're a little fucked up because they don't I know how to keep their they don't know how to keep their lats tight mm -hmm. because the lat position changes a little bit. I do see that a lot, so I yeah. want to put that out there. Yeah, I've mm -hmm. I've also used it as a really uh, successful tool teaching people how to maintain their upper back and training mm -hmm. their upper back in the squat better because I think even the lower bar with you know the the wider pad still puts that weight a little in front of you mm -hmm. so there still is that tendency to like pull people forward yeah. I think if you're strong and well positioned in the upper back you can resist it whereas mm -hmm. the higher bar I think is you know built a little different but yes yes yeah safety squat bar underrated next question is trap bar trap bar Overrated. <laughs> I got overrated as well. I have never really felt like I got much out of it. It's like, it's cool, I guess. It's a little less specific. So, you know, maybe fun to do in like a deload or like off season mm -hmm. block or something, but I don't ever feel like it gives me that much. I never had any experience using one until I came to West Side. So there's, it was, and it wasn't there at first. So probably, 14 years training beforehand. And then one came in, and I believe we used it once, and then Louie threw it in the dumpster. <laughs> um, and the reason, Louie-ish reason, was it's working your quads too much. You know, oh, okay. Be because of the position of the bar, right? And you know the bar yeah, is in lot, front, especially right? the so high handles. Quad, but yeah. A deadlift is posterior chain, lower back. Yeah. So it's like call this. This is not doing what we need to do. This is a waste of time. Of Get it out of here. Um, <clears throat> when I've tried to implement it in with lift with power lifters, I've never seen any correspondence to yeah. anything. Now with athletes in general. I would probably use that more than I would use a deadlift, but then I'd even step back and say, well, why Why am I doing this? Right. You know, I can probably find something better to use yeah. than that as well. So it's it's so f***ing overrated. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> Next one is belt squat. Belt squat. Mm. <sighs> yeah. I'm gonna do it again. Oh, God. And I'm gonna go the other route. <laughs> yeah. I think it's overrated. Yeah, I'm gonna go overrated. Um, I know the benefits of that, yep. you know, the distraction and all that because of the spinal loading and all the other kind of stuff. But as, as things do, the pendulum swings either too far. Or, <laughs> yeah, you know exactly, exactly. And right now it's kind of in this, it swung way too far phase. And it's like, <laughs> it, it is kind of like a deload if you want to say that one, it, it's, it distracts the spine. But I wonder, you know, are you doing enough shit to even compress it to need to be distracted in the first place? Right. Because it's getting put in so frequently that, you know, I used to put in things like high rep dumbbell presses as a break from the heavy bench presses mm -hmm. just to keep the work in. Yeah, for sure. But not beat the shit out of yourself. And this belt squat was kind of like that too. Yeah. Now it's like, the, like part of the whole thing. Right. Like, so a lot more emphasis put yeah, on it. People and are it's expecting like, are, to get more yeah, out of it. Like, you're going to have a, like a belt squat on week three, then a deload on week four. It's like, wasn't the f***ing belt squat a deload? <laughs> the belt squad like, would be the deload. That's kind of where we've yeah. gotten to where that's why I fall on that overrated part. Yeah. Um, and a year, I mean, maybe I may be saying underrated. Yeah, you know? exactly. It's just how the nature of the whole industry goes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think kind of similar answer for me. Seeing it so hyped up, I think a year or two ago, some of the... Some of the, the, the more well-known IPF lifters were massive proponents of the belt squat. And it was gonna, you know, it was the reason for their recent progress in squat. Introducing this movement was, you know, the <laughs> best thing ever. And honestly, I've tried a number of different belt squats and I'm not sure that I've been able to find one that actually like doesn't just kind of feel weird and like it pulls you a little strangely and you're rocking onto your toes a bit too much. And it's like, well, I could just leg press. It feels mm -hmm. pretty much the same to me, and somebody's gonna light me up in the comments, but. I, they are different though, I mean, because it's, you know, I got an ATP, which is Louis, which goes, you know, mm -hmm. for. I saw you got the pit shark yeah, over yeah, there Yeah, so it goes in different directions, and I got the regular pulley, which is ours, mm -hmm. and then a pit shark, and they all are different. Yeah. 
you know, so the, uh, the leverage one. I've only one, tried a few. Yeah, the leverage one I'll use if I'm just trying to bury somebody's dick in the dirt. <laughs> right, right. You right. Know, or the, the training's not even practical. It's like, you're going to do 30 reps and I'm going to make you do 20 more. Right, just right. Some kind of like gr gruesome rest pause yeah, shit. Yeah, that but. works because you can hold on. Hell, even if they cheat, you just make them do 10 more reps. Right. So now their lats get fatigued too. Yeah. That's with with the leverage thing. That's probably the better one with Louis thing because you can go side to side and right. step off to the side. You know, I can see some benefit, you know, to that. Sure. I don't do a lot of it, but if I was working with the wrestlers and stuff like that, potentially I would see that. Okay. Yeah. Um, the straight pulley here is normally where I'll default to. Yeah. For those reasons, like you know, look, you've been pounding over 88% or 85% for four weeks. We need a break, but I'm not, some people I'm not comfortable with a full deload, like nothing, right? Right, Because then they can go from like 88%, then do you go to 90? You know what I'm saying? Or you gotta go to 88 to 86, 88, 90. Right, you know, does right. that mean a whole new block? Yeah. Um, so it's, it can fill a gap there. Mm -hmm. As long as they have the ability, this is the key thing. As long as they have the ability to feel the movement, the squat movement in the lower body the same way they do when they squat. Right, so as that long as you can yeah. like recreate something that's gonna be pretty. And that becomes tricky if you're a close dance squatter, if not impossible. Right. Right, because the way it's gonna pull you down, yeah. the, and with where that cable is and where your hip is, isn't how that bar sits. Right. You, you, so the, yeah. the medium to wide, almost dead on. Sure. You know, so it's... And I think maybe that's what I found is like, I continually feel like I'm being pulled forward in the yes, bottom. Yes, Because I had a pretty, pretty like moderate to narrow mm -hmm. stance squat now, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Overrated belt squat, get it out of here. This next one is the monolift. The monolift. Hmm. Hmm. I'm just gonna... I'm just gonna be controversial. <laughs> just for the sake of disagreeing on mm -hmm. one. I'm gonna say overrated. What do you got, Dave? Underrated? Yeah, I'm gonna say underrated, and the reason is probably not because of what you think. <clears throat> the reason is the majority of the lifters today, now, have to walk it out, mm -hmm. right? So, that's important to know. So yep. if they're gonna use the monolith, they still need to walk it out. I'm okay. not gonna be a Okay, so there's, a, there's an asterisk. There's, there's an asterisk, Monolith right? with walkout. Yes, okay. because you can, we need to have the walkout as a question. Is the walkout, the walkout is fucking underrated because people need to practice the fucking walkout. Okay. Because they don't. That's one of the pet peeves when I work with people and they have to walk it out is their walkout looks, they don't even think about it until they get to like 60%. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you stupid <laughs> You know? <laughs> They're taking it for every, a walk the, and every, dance yeah, every, and... every, this is part of your setup, man, yeah. the bar, everything. So that aside, with, with the monolift, if you're dealing with groups of lifters, mm -hmm. and or if it's a school dealing with groups of lifters, and you have multiple racks, you have to then set the lifters up based upon their height. Sure. Yeah. And their strength isn't going to be equated to no, their height. No, there's going to be a lot of plate loading. Yeah. So loading. where with a monolift, you can get up, down, in, out, no matter what. Mm -hmm. You know, in a fast period of time, and not have to worry about okay, let's take it from this J cup to this J cup or this J cup, or you have to use this rack and then you have to right. use this rack. So from a timing standpoint and the standpoint of how organized you can keep the training in a gym going, mm -hmm. it's it's by far the best thing out there. Now you have the mono hooks that can go into racks, but now you're if you're leaning into the hooks, you can miss the hook. Right. You know, there's a lot of things that go along with that. Now, so that's where I see it from that side. Yeah. Now, if you're gonna talk about not multiply lifting or not lifting that you can use the monolift of competing, well then they need to know how to use it. Cause right. it's not just, stand, it's not as easy as people think it is. Yeah. But from a me director standpoint, you most certainly don't wanna fucking use a monolift if they have to walk it out. Right. Because the moving and setting it up is way harder than well, setting up a combo lift. Beefy, they have a huge footprint, <laughs> yes. they're heavy as hell. Mm -hmm. And I guess my, my counter argument would be a lot of the stuff that you're talking about being able to do in terms of like having quick transitions between lifters and change the height really quick can be solved with a like a combo rack like we use in, in tested competition, right? Yeah. Because it yeah. has the same kind of lever arms. Mm -hmm. It's a little more portable, but I think the big thing that comes down 
or, or that, that is often brought up in these discussions between, you know, combo versus monolift is the catch chains and the safety aspect of it, mm -hmm. right? Because in, in, for example, the IPF, we have our combo rack. It's, you know, it's portable, it, it does all that stuff. But if somebody misses a squat, your spotters catch that or it hits the floor and that's mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. right? So if your spotters aren't competent, I mean, I've seen lifters get caught under it and mm -hmm. trapped under it and mm -hmm. spit out the front and it's not nice. But then again, I've seen, you know, people lose a finger because the bar lands on the catch chains and they're in the wrong spot at the wrong time. So yes. what do you think about the safety difference or, I mean- I don't even like the spot chains if you really want me to be serious about it. I like good spotters. Yeah, Right, that's because fair. what what I saw over the years happen with spot chains and to a certain degree, even the spot arms and the combo racks is spotters get lazy because they know that's there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So then what would begin to happen with the spot chains, the spot chains originally started for if somebody missed the weight, you could grab it and set, set it, it on there on yeah. the chain. It wasn't there for somebody to just and dump like it on catch them. and then yeah. swing and do all this other stuff. But lifters are lifters and you know, <laughs> yeah. shit in this the sport. world round. Yeah, yeah. If, if it can happen, it can happen. <laughs> but over the years, I, you know, I'd start to see people that would, you know, uh, you know, pick the lift and then not feel right. And then just <laughs> throw it off their back. Oof. I'm like, holy shit, you know? So we had to put caution signs on our monolift saying, don't use spot straps, you know, because it would hit it and it would um, like swing, swing yeah. and then swing out and then flip a monolift. So we had to change the design of the monolift for all this Jeez. kind of shit. And so there's always, I mean, it made the monolift better essentially, sure. but the spotter should have just stayed good. Mm -hmm. You know, but as the sport's grown, and I get that, as the sport's grown, this may be a negative that I've never even thought of until now. There's more meets. Mm -hmm. So it's probably harder to get good spotters. All right, I think we're gonna move on to the next category, category which is movements. Movements. And mm. the first movement is sumo deadlifts. Sumo deadlifts. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go here right now. <laughs> I mean, I, it could go... What did you say? Depending on what we're... Like, I kind of have both opinions. I think overrated in the sense that people think that you're going to pull sumo and it's just like going to magically... Mm -hmm. You're going to put 200 pounds on your on your deadlift. And I mean, I did, but whatever. Um, <laughs> but underrated... <laughs> <laughs> underrated because people who pull sumo are cool and sumo deadlifts are cool. It allowed me to work past, like, terrible hip pain that wouldn't let me deadlift otherwise. So I'm a sumo stan. I think it's one of the pendulum things, right? So as, as, as people start, more people start to pull sumo, there's gonna be more pushback from that. Mm -hmm. uh, a decade ago, nobody gave a f Yeah. You <laughs> yeah. know what I'm saying? It, it didn't uh, really make any, back, it didn't make a difference <laughs> one way or another. Um, the best strategy was to be able to be strong at both. Yeah. If you if you jacked your hip up a little bit on the squats, unless it's you, then you, <laughs> yeah. you know then you could you could just pull conventional. Yeah. Or if you jacked a quad up, you could just pull sumo. There's there were there's options. Yeah. And um, somewhere along the line, it became cheating, which I don't understand, um, or known as cheating, which I don't understand. Um, it's just the nature of the sport. So I'm saying it's overrated at this point because it's on the, like the first thing that we talked about. It's not that the after the Baconator, whatever the other one was, <laughs> you know, it's just it's 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 the pendulum it's swung too far. Yeah, like the belt squat. It's like okay, let's just get this back to normal again. Yeah, and there you there you go. Yeah, they're and not going to take it out of the meats. Yeah, I mean, who knows? You know, yeah. and if you're and if you, if you hate sumo and you think it's cheating and you compete, then you suck. Like, why don't you pull sumo? Then? <laughs> you're just okay with getting beat by some. I don't understand that, right? Yeah, I mean, if it's gonna give you 200 pounds, why don't you do it and exactly. win something? Yes. Yeah, there you go. I mean, you work your. You, you, I mean, oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> I mean, they'll do everything else in their power to increase their total. Yeah. Except that. Like, no, you just yeah. suck at it. So because you <laughs> suck at it, you're going to make fun of the people that are good at it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that's the truth. I mean, it's just what it uh, is. Sweet vindication. <laughs> this next one is box squats. Box squats. Mm. Okay, Again, it depends go. on the context. Yeah. But. What'd you put? I said over it. Yeah, I got underrated. 
I have used them very successfully with a small number of my clients. Specifically when I have lifters who like pop forward in the bottom. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to sit back into the squat. So for that like specific instance, I absolutely see the use case for them. However, I remember when I was a novice and intermediate because I you know, watched and followed a lot of your guys' mm -hmm. stuff. I was like, well, box squats are the shit. Like I have to be box squatting. I got to get good at it. And I could just never figure it out. Mm -hmm. Like I wasn't sure if I should sit all the way down. Like, should I relax a little bit or should I, you know, kind of yeah. lean back and then rock to come up. And it just, it made squatting confusing for me. So mm -hmm. if, if, if I was asked this question, say six, seven, eight years ago, I would have said they're overrated, right? <clears throat> because that was the gospel. Mm -hmm. Like everybody had to box squat. And, um, and I may have been part of that push, but you still got a free squat and a meet. So at that point, definitely, we're now that, pen, again, the pendulum, yep, right? Exactly. So now the pendulum swung and it's, it, it may actually be where it needs to be, right? Mm -hmm. It may be, I mean, I'm biased, so I'm gonna think it's a little bit further on the, on the negative side than what it should be, but I'm biased. Right. So I should feel that way, you know? So <laughs> yeah. if it's neutral and I feel a little biased, it's probably where it needs to be. Right. Um, where, the, the advantages I see with, where I see people mess it up, so mm -hmm. I'll go with that, is they, they associate the box squat with a wide stance, sit way back, right. pot, you know, straight shin angle movement, mm -hmm. which it can be, right? And for some people that is their competition squat, for other people it could be an accessory they're gonna do for adductors, glutes, hamstrings but it's not their squat, mm -hmm. right? So if they're to use the box squat in some kind of phasic structure with the program, it needs to match what their free squat is as far as their knee and, and foot angle, you know, shin angle, mm -hmm. right? So if it's midfoot, that's where it needs to be. And I saw this as being an issue when I first started doing seminars because there, some people had great correspondence, some people had shitty correspondence. And I'm like, well, no wonder you do this and then you do that. You've never practiced that, and that's what like you're doing to me. Totally different. Yeah, movements. like you're swatting wide, sitting way back. You're developing your posterior chain and all that, but you don't feel comfortable doing that when you compete, mm -hmm. right? And some people's just joints are not built to be able to do that. So then they go back to their other one, and they're all they're they're all <laughs> up. Well, obviously there's no coordination because you haven't done it. All you've done is that. Yeah. You know, so great accessory, but why don't you take that competition squat, sit on the box that way, keep tension. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this is kind of harder to explain because like how much tension are you supposed to keep on the box? Well, that's kind of the thing that boggled me. Yeah, when just, I was, yeah, just I was sit completely it. relaxed and stand up. Or Louis used to say, sit down and relax your hip flexors. And I'm like, Louis, you can't do that physically. That's impossible to sit down and relax your hip flexors. Okay. It's just that you, you, you can't. Right. You know, and so the, that's the other part of it. You need to maintain some kind of rigidity to mm -hmm. be able to have that force without this swinging type of thing. So the, the problem became that what they were practicing had nothing to do with how they were competing. And a lot of the times it really didn't have anything to do with increasing weak points that were actually their weak points. Right. So then it kind of went out the window. The benefits are numerous, you know, but you know where the depth is. You can correct, especially teaching a squat. Mm -hmm. If I'm teaching somebody on the squat, actually I've kind of changed a little bit on that now, but I used to always use the box then I would move them off the box. Mm -hmm. Now I'll start with, you know, the free squat. And if there's issues like you're talking about, right. then I put the box in because you can't just say, hey, pause. Like just pause in the bottom, you know, arch, pull your chest up. Yeah. You know, they have to be able to stop, fix their position, right. and then say, you know, come straight up okay. and then reinforce it back in. So our last, potentially last one in this category would be accessories not specific to powerlifting. So like bicep curls, like lateral, lateral delt raises, raises yeah. stuff like that. Oh man, you're catching me on this one. Bulgarian split squats, leg extensions, those kinds of things, but for power lifters. All right, I'm gonna go underrated. I too am going to say underrated. Okay, why? So I think that past a certain point, it seems like lifters who are in that intermediate kind of area, I think that there's this kind of correlation with 
getting a lot better and stronger and more efficient in your main movements and maybe not being able to handle quite as much overall training stimulus specifically if you're trying to deliver it all through competition and very competition like movements and maybe this is my own personal bias i've seen it in a number of athletes i wouldn't say it's a a blanket trend but it's in enough athletes that i think it's worth you know uh its own kind of thought or whatever so i think that for those lifters when you can't you know push the needle and add more training stimulus through those main you know pause squats or tempo squats or whatever if you can do some less specific stuff you know be it leg press leg extension whatever and i specifically very much think that in the case of people like me who have long long ass arms and underdeveloped upper bodies and you know uh, have needed to like go up and up and up and up and up in weight classes before their bench finally starts to come around to being a respectable number i think those movements really help build a lot of muscle mass for the upper body and i think that just adding muscle mass to the upper body is probably one of the best things i ever did for my bench so whether it was flies or raises or curls or extra tricep work or whatever i think that bodybuilding style work can be super valuable to help like get past some of those plateaus that you'll run into if everything is just super specific all the time yes i got a couple ways to address this the first would be with a beginner mm -hmm. where an isolation movement which is going to sound weird because i'm going to say beginners should do isolation movements where sure. yes i believe they all should do compound movements yeah. right we all then nobody's going to disagree with that no. but a beginner's and intermediates need to develop a mind muscle connection. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if, if I'm working with advanced power lifter and it's a squat and they're just not engaging the lats, the lat, the meat part of the lats, not the upper back, but the lats, the way I would like them to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And they don't know what a lat pump feels like, or they mm -hmm. don't know what that feels like. And there's a lot that don't because mm -hmm. all they've ever done is SBD, SBD, SBD. Sure. So they know what lat tightness feels like on a squat, but they don't know what lat tightness is beyond what they know, which mm -hmm. what they know might be a six, but they need a 10. Where if they have developed that through some kind of bodybuilding training, at least on their upswing or at some point, then so they can learn the difference between doing a lat pull down with 120 pounds and getting super pump and going to failure between 12 and 15 just because you're, you're moderating tempo and how mm -hmm. hard you flex and stretch. And they know how to do that compared to the person that's got to use the whole stack and wing it down for sets of eight, mm -hmm. right? That's the power lifter who's going to wing it down for sets of eight. Don't be smirking heavy. at me over there, don't. You know, the heavy ones, right? <laughs> well, it's got its point, right? It's got its point, <laughs> but what's the goal here? You yeah. know, what is the goal? Because I'm pretty sure that heavy set of eight on a lap pull down isn't going to help your lifts, right? You're just trying to build the muscle. Can you build the muscle with half that weight with a fuller range of motion and a tighter contraction? Not only that, but now your recovery demands are going to be less than if it was the whole thing. Sure. Because systemically, everything adds together, mm -hmm. right? So developing that skill to be able to take a muscle to failure or the effective rep range with lower loads that are going to be less joint damage on movements that have no correspondence we've already determined that mm -hmm. with the question mm -hmm. they have no correspondence so why 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 accumulate the joint damage and all the other shit when the goal is muscle hypertrophy or just activation learning how to activate that again that's easier being developed on that upswing but it's hard because teenagers love to lift heavy shit mm -hmm. you know so it's a balance type of thing um now the second part when you're dealing with lifters higher on the spectrum after they do a big meet there's there's micro trauma your spine is has micro fractures your knees f***ed up there's things are f***ed up after a meet to where i've always been an advocate of a hypertrophy phase sure yep. you know and if after that meet some of the rules that i'll have for people is no bars on your back no bar no barbell on your back no barbell in your hands for if it was you, like six to eight weeks, knowing you're only gonna do five. But I would say, I'd say like eight weeks, right? Because- <laughs> I don't know how you know me this well. Yeah, we well, it's just, just all lifters that yesterday. are advanced. So you gotta always add three <laughs> weeks more. And if it's a beginner, I'm gonna say two. They don't need it, yeah. but two. Because we wanna let those fractures heal, for one thing. So now if the bar's off your back, what can you do? Well, you can do 
lunges, you can do step ups, you can do any, any leg work that you can do that does not have compressive force on your spine and the reps can't be under 10. Now you can do anything for your upper body that you don't have a barbell in your hands. So now you got dumbbells, you got cables, you have all these other things, mm -hmm. which all happen to be the movements like we're talking about, yep. which are great for hypertrophy. It's great for this unloading phase, right? To kind of go in there to let all this other stuff heal. It gives probably a higher probability of real hypertrophy because now you're, as a power lifter, you only have so much time mm -hmm. for hypertrophy. Then you got to kind of leave the other stuff in, as you're saying, and this is the benefit of that, leave the other stuff in throughout the other phases to maintain the hypertrophy you built, because more than likely you're not gonna build more hypertrophy as you're going through these strength and peaking Past phases. Past a certain point, for sure. You know, and well, you may, let's say you could, mm -hmm. but to what recovery demand is that gonna happen? Right. You know, where you can push that stuff during this other phase because you took those top end things out. So your recovery, you just took out 60% of the, probably more, probably 80% of the shit you need to recover from, that's gone. Mm -hmm. So now the volume can just go really high on all these other things. And I think people would be surprised to find how weak they actually are on some of these things. Mm -hmm. Now, when they go back, and this is why a lot of people won't do this. When they go back into their normal training, they're not gonna be as strong, Right. Yeah. obviously. Right, but a transitional block of four weeks is gonna get you right back to where you yeah, need to be. exactly. And then you feel better, you're healthier, because at your level, the person that goes into the meet, the least beat up, usually is the one to win. The next category is like training modalities, I think is kind of what we were calling okay. it. Yep. Um, so we're gonna start off with RPE. RPE. Oh man, this one's stumping me, man. Mm. All right, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. Try to go over there. We go. Mm. All right. All right. Want me to start? Yep. All right. The reason I went overrated is RPE is not that big of a thing in the the domains of powerlifting that I live in. Mm -hmm. Right. So. I have to think outside of my domain and then understand how small that domain is compared to the broad overall scope. Sure. Okay. And a broad overall scope, it's huge, right? It's huge. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's kind of just a given. Like people just it is. accept it's a that given. that's a part of. Yes. And it's, yeah. I operate in this weird world, you know, that in a bubble, you mm -hmm. know, that. We all do, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, it, it's not so much that, you know, it's, it's, like a perceived, this kind of, we kind of got the same thing. It's like, I'll tell people to kind of work off a perceived max of that day, which is essentially an RPE. But with any of these things, and as I talked about with Mike, the, the problem with these things is how is it anchored, mm -hmm. right? If, if the coach can anchor it with the client and that anchoring is hell, if it's just even within one RPE, right? Mm -hmm. Success. Yeah. But a lot of the times that anchor is f you know, and it's so thrown out the window. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, it ends up sometimes like an eight RPE is like a 50 pound PR. Like how the f did that happen? <laughs> you know, and it's just, and some of it falls on, I would say probably most of it is gonna fall on the actual client. You know, I don't blame all this on the coaches so much because the client has to have a f***ing clue too, mm -hmm. right? So there's a two-way street with all that. But I don't know what the answer is, right? Because you have percentages which we know are all flawed unless you have a really good idea of exactly what that person can do at that time. Mm -hmm. Because as we spoke on the podcast, your competitive lifts could be 10% higher than your training maxes. Oh yeah, easily. So you can't yeah. use that, right? Mm -hmm. You can't. Well, you could if you adjust everything yeah, as down. as long as you scale it. You know, you yeah. could. Um, so that's flawed. And it's gonna be flawed on day to day and how you feel. Mm -hmm. uh, reps, and rever reps and reserve are definitely flawed when you're dealing with threes, fives, and singles. Mm -hmm. You know, it might work for hypertrophy work, tens, sure. twelves, and stuff like that. Yep. But even that becomes flawed because what mental state are you allowed to be in? Can you be aroused or right. not aroused? Right. Yep. You know, th there's a lot of factors that play. That's why it's gotta be anchored. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's enough anchoring going on with that because even in powerlifting that an 8.5 which to i see just like 85 percent you know so sure. that, that's kind of how i round the things okay. so that 8.5 that can be one type of stimulus where you're just chill mm -hmm. you're not visualizing you're just like this is like the last warm-up right that is a different stimulus than if you're like oh mother i need to be ready for this 
then that's a different stimulus than if you're pacing back and forth and you hit ammonia. Mm -hmm. So which scale are we working from? Yeah. Right? So it's like the RPE has to have that scale, but then there needs to be another scale. Like here's the arousal context, level. Context, yeah. Context, yeah. right? Yeah. Context, good, you know, in, but given that there's no other alternative, mm -hmm. what are you just yeah. gonna say, do threes? <laughs> do threes <laughs> until it feels right. Yes, yeah. yes. I, I think, yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I think that's, I think what you're saying there as, as kind of like a, a potential flaw if it's not addressed is one of the things that I think is a strong point of RPE. And that is that it's it's a language, right? It's a way of, of like you, you said, anchoring. Yes. So that you can present the expectations and, you know, layer on the context and over time build that into the relationship so that when you say eight, they know what you mean. And when they say eight, you know what they mean. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that it goes back and forth and you have a, a, an agreed upon term or language for like how hard something was. That's interesting. I did not think of that. It opens the narrative. It opens the dialogue. Yeah. It allows you to discuss in, in relative terms, like something that you both kind of sure. create, right? Well, they, I might have, say, what is an 8.5? Yeah. I mean, you, you see what I'm saying? So, yeah, you know, that's better than if you said 80% because they're just going to take 80% of whatever they think their max is. But if it's an eight point, you really with them 8.75, right? <laughs> then you know, they're going to ask you like, what is 8.75? Yeah. So now you open that dialogue. I didn't yeah. think of that. That's, and I that's, think that's, that's, so that's one of the things that I try to work on with my clients. And I definitely have very different RPE scales for different clients. Yes. You know, uh, I might have one guy who hits an eight and it's like, phew, it flies, but like, I know where his training needs to be. I know that if I say an eight, he's going to do that. And that's what I want him to do there. And I have another client who, you know, if I prescribe an eight, she's going to like grind mm -hmm. and it's going to be hard, but you know, I know what she's going to do for an eight. She knows what I mean when I say yeah. an eight. And it's like, you kind of, I, I have these like different kind of ideas of what I mean for different clients okay. in different phases. And I've even started thinking about trying to find ways of, of incorporating RPE into like, what's the RPE of this block? You know what I mean? Interesting. So yes. on an overall scale in this like five week wave, mm -hmm. you know, I want you to go up to an eight RPE, but I want this eight RPE to be relative to the block only being a seven out of 10. Oh yeah, I get it. And yeah. if we go up to an eight RP in this block where we're like, you know, peaking yeah. into a meet, the overall block RP is going to be a nine. So like this eight is going to mean like, yes, the ammonia and the pacing and whatever. Whereas the other eight RP is like stone yeah. cold fate, like just, just yeah, chilling. Tricky, Cause you know, I got anchor two things, man. That's yeah. So I haven't really implemented yeah, that yeah. with many people. It's just something I've been rattling around in my head, but yeah, no, I think the big yeah. thing is it, it, it as long as you continue to work on it and, and back and forth with the client and say like, that's more than I want to see for an eight or that's less or whatever. And you have that ongoing dialogue to refine it down to that anchor point. Yeah. I think that's the strength of it is it allows you to, to have something that you can both like communicate with back and forth. Yeah. We, we should note that what we're talking about is the back end RPE because what you see somebody post on Instagram where the deadlift takes eight seconds to pull up <laughs> yeah. and then they say seven RP with a mystery. <laughs> yeah, RPE yeah. seven. <laughs> yeah. That's not what we're talking about. Yeah, that's a little different. <laughs> so we'll end it on speed work. Speed work. Mm. All right. Do you want to call it speed work or do you want to call it dynamic effort? How do you want to do you just in general? Let's just stay so, with speed work. People know it is speed work. So what is yeah, speed work? Well, just for okay. context, when I came up with this one or thought about wanting to discuss this one with you, it's the idea of like the, you know, 30 to 40% with bands, 10 by three, like super kind of quick through. And maybe I don't even know what I'm talking about, but that was kind of my Okay, so I'll, I'll answer that. Yeah, of it, we'll, right? we'll do this in two phases. So we'll do it as that first. Okay. Right? And just, I'm going to go overrated. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And the reason for that is I don't think that that's actually doing what people think it's doing. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so that becomes, you know, a cluster of just it be anchoring with RPE. You know, it, it becomes a communicational nightmare. Sure. Like what percentage of band should you use? Like, does it matter? Like it, there's, there's so much free that kind of goes around with all that. Yeah. That 
for a lot of people happens way too soon. Mm -hmm. And so I'm speaking now just specifically, I guess accommodating resistance is where I'm speaking here. Not so much the the speed work, but the Mm -hmm. accommodating resistance. And it's introduced too soon for too many people. And because they're not technically sound, right? So now you're gonna throw something in that's gonna make them, if it's heavy like what you're talking about, technically unsound. Now, if they can't get tight on a squat and it's a gen pop client and they squat 75 pounds, right? The hardest thing to teach that person is to brace and get tight because it's the bar. Now, if you put a mini band on that bar, which isn't a lot of tension, as soon as they step out, they got to catch themselves. Mm -hmm. They they have to get tight, right? The other thing is the hardest thing to teach a gen pop, and I do this with the gen pop clients I worked with, is how to stand up with compensatory acceleration. So if I had them sit on a box with a bar and stand up, you know, I put a little bit of band on there, they stand up a little bit, it come right back down, then they stand up, right? right? So when I'm talking about the band stuff, keeping people's technique up, that's not what I'm talking about. Because that's a completely different application because it's doing a different, it's more stability type thing. Right. On the other side, it becomes this giant cluster of, well, I need 30% bar weight, 40% band, (laughs) And just whatever it is, right? Yeah. It's a, to kind of become whatever this circumax thing is. This is where it becomes overrated. They'll see that stuff and they're gonna think, that's it. That's the magic sauce. Mm-hmm. I need to do that. You know, no, what they need to do is learn how to bench, learn how to squat, and learn mm-hmm. how to deadlift. Being simple. Mm-hmm. You know it, I know it, anybody that's been around a long time knows it. If you just fix your technique, spend a month, just fix your technique you'll put 50 pounds on a lift. It'll take you four years to put 50 pounds on a lift, if that even gets done. Sometimes you're just happy as to get back to where it was. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You see what I'm saying? 100%, yeah. Like that's low hanging fruit that falls down there. Now, if I go with what you said, speed work, right? So take that aside and if we just say speed work, how would you rank that? So again, like my understanding of speed work, and we could just honestly call this segment, like Bryce asks Dave questions that Bryce had when he was 23 and learning mm-hmm. how to train. Yeah, <laughs> because yeah, yeah, he yeah, saw yeah. West Side stuff sure. and was like, how sure. do I do this? And then did a bunch of stuff that didn't feel very effective at all. But yeah, to me that was like, okay, you had your 10 by three mm-hmm. and then your eight by four and whatever. Mm-hmm. And it was like some kind of just moving as fast as you can. And I think, the issue for me or, or the problem that I had with it and that I think I would still, well, maybe not now have with it because like you said, it's a, it is a technique thing. And I think mm-hmm. if you can apply a lot of force, then sure, maybe training with lighter bar loads, you know, you can put a lot more into it. I certainly don't train with, mm-hmm. you know, like my training does not line up with what it should be in the RPE chart, right? If I'm doing a set of five at eight and it says it should be 78% according to the mm-hmm. RPE chart, I'm taking like five to 10% off of that, mm-hmm. right? Because if I train with those loads, it just, it is too much for me. So I think being able to move efficiently is kind of a prerequisite for that. But anyways, speed work to me has, has always been that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So if, if I look at speed work, what we're looking for is that ability to apply force. Right. Right. And Cause you, that compensatory acceleration, you want it to be able to transfer into the heavier loads and all that. Sure. There will be debates on that yeah. where those lighter loads won't transfer to the compensatory acceleration and the heavier loads. I understand that debate. I don't agree with it, but I understand the debate. I know where they're coming from. Right. Yes, you're still gonna be applying it with heavier loads, but you should be applying it with everything over 135. Right. You know, cause you're priming the system. So the assumption is that you're, you're, yes. you're applying maximal yes. force and maximal. So with that, the other benefit of speed work is there is eight to 10 sets. So if you look at an intermediate lifter doing a set of five, maybe rep one looks good, maybe rep two looks good. It starts to fade on three, starts to fade on four, starts to fade on five. Sometimes rep one looks like shit, rep two looks good, Mm -hmm. rep three is okay, four and five look bad. Um, Either way, four and five usually don't look optimal to how you want them to actually squat in a meet. Right. Right, so I can make the argument that three of the five reps in most cases are reinforcing bad technique. Okay. Right? So if you compound that over a period of a month, that's a lot of reinforcing bad technique, then the reps that reinforce good technique, it can be debated, 
if the second rep even is part of it. You know what I'm saying? Like, because the first rep's really the one that matters. Mm -hmm. Where if I can lighten the load a little bit to where there can be accumulated fatigue because the rest periods, it don't need to be 30 seconds, but let's say right. the rest periods are 60 to 90 seconds, enough to have accumulated fatigue on the later sets. Right. So enough to have accumulated fatigue to where you have to think. You know, the, weights, the weight should already be heavier enough, you have to think about your technique, but then have that accumulated fatigue so they have to think about their technique with a little bit of fatigue, right? So the way you master a skill is, you know, you master it, you know, with verbal cues, then internal cues, and then, you know, as you're doing it, and then with fatigue, then under high stress, then under heavy load, mm -hmm. and under heavy load, high stress, fatigue, meet, right? right. There, there's a learning process that happens. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so some of those we can anchor with these heavier weights because of that fatigue. So out of that, if it's eight or 10 sets of two, I got 20 repetitions with a good enough weight to reinforce good technique, which over a period of a month, that's 100 technical reps. Right. Compared to somebody that's doing, you know, two sets of three or two sets of five, you know, the two sets of three or two sets of five, if the first two only matter, then you have four reps on week one, you know, by the end of the month, you like 16 total reps reinforcing good technique mm -hmm. compared to 100 for an intermediate lifter, which is going to have the greatest technical efficiency over a period of time. Right. That, right? So, so let's not call it speed work. Let's call it technique work. Let's right. call okay. it practice, right. right? So there's things will work for multiple reasons, sometimes reasons that aren't what are being stated. Mm -hmm. If there's anything I've learned over this whole game, over this whole period of time, is usually the reason that's being stated by whoever the practitioner or coach is, is not really the reason why it's working. Right, okay. Right, and it's not because they're trying to sell snake oil, maybe they are, but it's, normally it's not that. Normally it's all good intent, mm -hmm. but it's just, everybody's just doing their best. You know what I'm saying? They're just, just doing to their best. For to the try, mechanism yeah. for whatever. You're yeah. trying to take what science is out there that can be applied, but more so you're trying to take what everybody else is doing and fit it in a way that fits your paradigm, mm -hmm. that fits your bias, because that's going to be the best way you can actually pass it on to somebody else. And then that, you know, over a period of years just becomes better and better and better and better. And the lifters get better and better and better and better and better because of that. Mm -hmm. You know, where that's why I'm not real big on trying to change somebody's philosophy. Right. I'm bigger on let's develop yours. Because when you really have that and you're still open to learning new things, then the people that come up underneath you are going to be better than you. And then hopefully their, their people yeah. will be better than they are. So. That leaves the hole then, that if that is just practice, when does the strength work get done, mm -hmm. right? So that's where you deal with blocks and stuff like that. So it's, as we said yesterday, everything's still blocked, periodized and so forth. Right. So there, there will be a lot of lifters I will have do speed work, mm -hmm. but it's really technical work. The way that I, if I really say how I see it the most, it's technical work because they have to become proficient before they can actually start displaying force with the bar path that I want. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the bar path is a mess and if they display too much force, it's more of a mess. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you, you gotta slow them down, which is counterproductive to what speed work would be, mm -hmm. but what is the goal of, I guess this would be the, the short form answer to a very long answer, <laughs> long answer, is what's it being done for in the first place? Yeah, what's the intent? What is yeah. the intent here? And once you define that, then structure it as that. Now, if the intent is, let's just throw a bunch of fucking bands on because so-and-so said that's what you're supposed to do, bad, bad, bad idea. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. So it turns out that speed work, as I understood it, basically has the same intent as all the uh, IPF sub-juniors tagging hashtag sub-six boys. <laughs> It's, it's come yeah, full yeah, circle, yeah, Dave. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, but again, like, <laughs> you know, that intent is there and uh, works for different reasons for different people. But that uh, that has been our episode of Underrated Overrated. So hopefully you all have enjoyed our chat with Dave. Dave, oh, thank you. thanks for being on yes. the channel for this one, man. And uh, go check out Elite yeah, FTS. Yeah. Two and, shakes. Um, yeah. We'll see you in the next one.